Syngenta Crop Protection Canada and CNM Seeds present the Wheat School, realagriculture.com. Phil, do you think there's a yield ceiling on wheat? Are we approaching that or are we, is there a lot higher yields to come? You know, it's interesting at this conference, I've met with different growers during the sessions, between the sessions, at the hotel, after the sessions, and you know, there's, there's a lot of opinions on that particular subject, and I mean, you'll talk to one grower who, who says he can raise 80 bushel wheat and that's his ceiling. Then you talk to another gr grower within maybe an hour or two that, that makes 120 bushel wheat average on fields and he sees on a calibrated yield monitor that he's making 160, 180 in regions. So I'm going to suggest a calibrated yield monitor would answer that question for a, produ for a producer. If a producer has a field of wheat that averages 80 and he sees on the yield monitor there are regions that make 120, 140, 160, mm -hmm. That gives you some perception as to what is available from a point of view of your potential. The challenge is taking 60 bushel regions to 160 bushel right. regions. We need to know and understand what those are. Is it soil? Is it drainage? Is it management? What's the reason? Right. And my next question was, do you think those yield, uh, bringing those, the yields up in those regions, is that going to be things like uh, genetics and fungicide applications or is it going to be more agronomic practices? You know, we've not really said much about it, but selecting varieties by soil type is important. We've found that certain varieties do better on clay soils, perhaps other varieties do better on the more challenged, coarse textured sandy soils. So maybe in the future there's some opportunities to do some variable rate seeding. Maybe there's some opportunity to, opportunities to do some different seed placement. You know, a lot of guys are running air seeders. There's two carts, there's two uh, hoppers on an air seeder. You know, I don't think we're too far away from being able to plant certain varieties in certain areas of the fields, or the varieties in other areas of the fields. The technology is there to do that. The management to implement it probably isn't yet. We don't fully understand the characteristics sounds of the varieties. Good. Sounds, sounds good, sounds simple. But we're not there yet. Not there. But it's something that's probably in need of some more work, because there's probably a lot of opportunities. And not just with varieties, but fertility in them areas. Uh, variable rate fertility is probably further ahead from point of view of management zones or regions or crop sensing. That's better understood, but I'm going to suggest variable rate placement of varieties by soil type, maybe variable rate fungicides. A lot of people will argue if areas of the field are denser, they need higher rates of fungicide. If areas of the field are, are lighter, there's no point putting a full rate of fungicide on. Let's reduce the rate down to smaller use rates within the, within the weaker areas of the field. So. You're probably not going to end up spending any more money, money per acre on the field. You're just going to spend your money more judiciously where it makes better return in the higher productivity areas, and the reverse is true. Is, is there an area of the world, Phil, where you would say uh, these wheat growers are the most innovative? There's areas probably South Dakota, North Dakota, that would be some of the most progressive. Uh, there's areas in Arizona and California that are very progressive. Uh, it depends a lot on the region, the crops that are grown within that region and the amount of money that region receives for different crops. But right. I'm going to say the Dakotas and, and Arizona and California would be up there. And so what makes them innovative? You know, Arizona has an average state yield between 100 and 110 bushels per acre. They do a really good job. I'm going to say that those guys down there are able to time applications exceptionally well, off the scale. If I work with a grower down there and I, I tell a grower we need to be spraying this field you know, on Wednesday of this week, they'll almost want to know, okay, we're going to start on Wednesday morning, is it going to be Wednesday afternoon, yeah. how many sprays do we need to put it on with, when do we need to be done by, what are the rates, what are the water volumes, what are the surfactants, what are the nozzles, I mean they're all about detail. And, and they're able to do that because of the stability of the climate. Stability of the climate would be part of it, yes, but in that region they also raise a lot of vegetables. So they understand the importance of timing, they understand the importance of micronutrients, they understand all of those elements very, very well. And that isn't always transferred to other areas, okay? Uh, I work with a lot of growers in, in Kentucky and surrounding states. Most of those over time have began to realize the importance of timing. But timing is just something that doesn't cost you any money at all, but it makes a huge impact on the bottom line. Right. Because unless you put a fungicide on at the right time, you know, if you're four days late putting a fungicide on, your percentage of, of control that you may receive from that product, and again, it depends on what disease you're going after, 
But if you're going after Fusarium Headlight and you're four days late, you're probably not going to get very good control. And you've spent the money, the same as what you would have spent if you got good control, but the, the difference is four days. They used to say in England the difference between a good farmer and a bad farmer was a week. <laughs> but it's not a week anymore, it's down to days, it may be two or three days. Mm -hmm. And it's all about time, and again it doesn't cost you any money. Yeah. Most, most times it doesn't cost any money at all. Thank you.